How does the academic hierarchy work, you ask? Well, let's start at the beginning. Today we're talking about the academic Ponzi- <coughs> Uh, I mean the academic pyramid scheme- <coughs> I mean today we're talking about how academia works, so buckle up and away we go. Let's start with the dregs, the bilge drinkers, the castoffs, also known as the adjuncts. Adjuncts generally need to have a master's degree, though quite a number of them have PhDs and wonder why they went to school for an extra 10 years to end up making the same amount of money as those with master's degrees. Really, the only difference for them is that you are supposed to call them doctor. It's no secret that the pay isn't great, and it's not uncommon to see adjuncts cobbling together five or six classes at different institutions to make ends meet. To say the job security is precarious would be an understatement, and classes can be cancelled at any time. I was once in a class where the adjunct teacher got five minutes into her opening lecture only to have a higher up come in and tell her that her class was cancelled. It was super embarrassing and she was quite humiliated, but such is the life of an adjunct where you have to get a bit creative to stretch that money to make ends meet. And yes, there are a number of stories of adjunct professors living in their cars. Adjuncts are the lifeblood of the university. They're cheap, they're dispensable, and with elite overproduction, they're a dime a dozen. Okay, this is getting a bit depressing and it's hitting a little too close to home. Let's move up a layer where we have the visiting assistant professors and postdocs. These are usually one to two year appointments that usually have better pay and job security than the adjuncts, and they've now become almost standard stepping stones, or stumbling blocks, to landing that tenure track job. This means that some academics end up taking multiple postdocs, sometimes moving across the country several times, just in the hope that they can burnish their resume enough to land their tenure track job. And you can just see it in the VAP and postdoc faces as they open up their emails like their Wonka chocolate bars, hoping desperately for that golden ticket. But as the wrappers pile up around them, it becomes increasingly clear they're not going to make it. For the lucky few who get that golden ticket, they get to climb that ladder to the assistant professor level. And now you're finally on the tenure track. You've made it. Kinda. Cause it's not all fun and games, it's actually do or die time. If you want that illustrious gift of tenure, you have to get the job done. The margins for error are slim, and far too many end up being crushed by the publish or perish monster. There are so many things to juggle. Your health, your teaching, your research, your personal life, and your departmental obligations. And really, I have never seen anyone juggle all five of these well. My estimation is that at best you can really only keep 2.5 balls in the air. And what gets you tenure at a tier 1 or 2 research university? It's not your family. It's not your health. It's your research. It's your department service. And your teaching has to be mediocre at least. I've seen this over and over again. I've seen tenure track professors suffer major health crises, know of a few full professors who have died of a heart attack in their 50s, the bill comes due eventually, and observed the desiccated home lives of many academics. The very best teacher I had as an undergraduate did not get tenure. He was the type of professor who knew everyone's face and name in a giant survey class of 125 students. But he was slow on his publishing, and he rocked the college's boat because he was interesting and actually had opinions. Now if you do make it to the tenured promised land, you can pretty much do whatever you want. Like mail it in on your teaching, eat pickles with ice cream, and try to get the adjuncts who you think have the wrong opinions fired. You also get to decide who gets to join your elusive club, which is a pretty awesome power to have, especially if you're the type of person who likes to weaponize petty slights. Above the tenured associate professors, we have the full professors, and this is where the going gets really good. You have all your classes figured out, the money is nice, and you really don't have to work very much if you don't want to. Sure, if you made it this far up, you're probably neurotic enough to keep up the grind, but really, you can put up your feet and relax. You can sit around in your fancy backyard with all your other fellow full professors and have a barbecue. The barbecues are really nice, so I hear. Sometimes they even invite the adjuncts. But we're not done yet. Above these folks, we have the chairs and deans, and these aren't necessarily always cushy positions of leisure, especially department chairs who have to deal with a lot of drama. But still, many of them really like wielding that power, often in narcissistic ways. And not all deans are bad, but I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily impressed with most of them as well. It's not just in the corporate world where failing up is a thing. 
And finally, at the very top, we have the university president and the board of trustees. These days, the university president's first job is fundraising. Gathering and counting those beans is the highest priority, which means the board of trustees looks for the CEO types, not people who are scholarly or intellectually curious. The board of trustees is also very interested in important things, like hiring new football and basketball coaches when the teams are losing. So that's it. Now you understand the academic pyramid scheme, and now you know why you should never go to grad school. If you like this video, please like it and subscribe to my channel because I've got more good ones coming. If you have any horror stories from academia we could all learn from, we'd love to hear from you in the comments below. And to everyone, thanks, as always, for watching.